Hi everyone, welcome back to another uh, video interview. Today I am very honored to be talking with none other than Tamara Pierce. But you go by Tammy, right? Yes, please. So Tammy, uh, why don't you tell our viewers a little bit about yourself and what you've written and who you are. I am a genuine, authentic Western Pennsylvania hillbilly. My family goes back in that part of the country, literally before the Revolutionary War. Wow. I grew up poor and got lucky and ended up at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia on scholarship and learned a great deal. None of it in writing. I took one writing course. I had gone through a five-year period in high school and early college of writer's block from my own work. So I took psychology and then the block broke summer before my junior year. By the end of my junior year, I'd sold my first short story. That gave me the courage to take a course in writing, short fiction. And I only ever took another course at Temple, writing for film. I finished my first book-length manuscript in June of 76. And it stank. More than most of us think of our first manuscript, it didn't just stink. Um, and it didn't just need work. It was dig a hole at the center of a crossroads at midnight, six feet deep, wrap it in aluminum foil, wrap it in lead foil, put a stake through it, cover it with cement, cover it with asphalt, bad. How did you feel when you realized that? I wasn't too broken up because it had done the one thing for me that I really needed it to do. It told me I could write a book. And six months later, I started what would become my first published quartet, The Song of the Lioness. So, you know, I did the usual thing after college. I did get a job for a year doing the one thing I was actually educated for, which was being a house mother in a group home for um, wayward girls. And I told them the story of Alana, suitably edited, kind of, sort of. Because the director said when he found out I had sex and drug and alcohol use and violence, those were the things that had gotten the girls into the home. So he felt it would be inappropriate for them to hear about it or read about it in a manuscript by an authority figure, which is what I was passing as at the time. So every day after school and every night before bedtime, when I was on shift, they would pull me, literally, to the dining room table with the binder in my hand and they'd say, Pierce, Pierce, tell us more about Alana. So I'd sit there with it in my lap and I would retell the story to them. And did you find that by retelling it verbally that you were able to identify things that worked better? Uh, were you fine-tuning the story as you retold it, or was it you were just sticking with the text on the page? Well, no. There were things that I knew I would change if I got the chance to rewrite it. And a year later, when an agent gave me back the manuscript and said, turn this into four books for teenagers, I realized I'd already done it because telling it to the girls, of course, I did have to rewrite it again. And then when Jean Carl looked at it and said, well, if you make the changes we discussed, I'll take the manuscript, I had to rewrite it again. Then after we signed the contract, I had to rewrite it again. Rewrites are not my favorite. No, I'm, I'm in the middle of one myself. Yeah. And, and enjoying every moment of agony as I oh, yeah. go through the pages. Yeah, such a delicious pain. But given all the rewriting that you did do on uh, Alana, do you feel that it ended up making it better than it would have been otherwise? And do you feel like you learned something from the process? Of course, always. You learn from every word you put on paper, even if it's a grocery list or a letter or an email. You learn something new about the language, which is something I am always telling people. But when you do rewrites, you learn not only something new about the book, when you're pulling stuff out and putting new work in, but you also learn more about your craft. That's why 
I recommend to people not only try different kinds of writing, but also, if you can, get work doing editing or even doing reading for someone else's books. Because so often you learn more about your own craft, critiquing someone else's work, helping them make their voices better. You bring back more to your own voice. Every time I rewrite, I learn, I make the book better. I see things that I didn't realize I'd put in there during the first or the second drafts. And I learn more about my craft to carry forward. That's the nature of the beast. You're always learning. You tell me a writer who says, I don't rewrite. And I look at that writer and I say, and you need to. And when people stop rewriting, they stop growing. And for a writer, for any artist who stops revising, even mentally, that's death. The minute you stop growing, the minute you stop learning, you have died creatively. You'll do the same thing over and over again for the rest of your life. So, so do you find that you uh, rewrite more or less now than you did when you started? Certainly I rewrite more. For this, I have to thank computers, too. Having to retype each and every page, and if I messed up too many things, or if I was too poor for type correct tape or white out, I'd have to retype it again. Suddenly, I had this device. I'd gone from this frustrating, obdurate medium to this wonderful green strip that was like a vine, a living thing, and I could move segments up and down and around, and suddenly rewrites weren't a chore. They were a delight, and so, yes, I definitely rewrite. I complain. I still complain, but once you get into it, once you really start, there's stuff you find that you forgot you did, and you go, wow, that's really cool. I must know what I'm doing. Of course, there are still the moments where you go, oh, that was me, wasn't it? Uh, nobody saw this but my editor, and thank heaven she seldom tells. She keeps threatening. And I actually love the, the way you work crafts and stuff into the magic and everything, because it, that's... I, I, I grew up in Montana, and I did a lot of working with my hands and crafts and stuff when I was a kid, and I love to see that brought into writing, brought into stories, because so often people nowadays are so disconnected from the natural world. And, you know, if you look at the old mythology and the myths and legends, a lot of times magic was tied to weaving or blacksmithing or the to or the symbols of such. And um, so I really like how you incorporated that into your magic. Yeah, and I grew up, a lot of it I spent in the country, and people canned and they grew stuff and they sewed and they knit and you know that's what they did and to me with my fumble fingers it just it looked like magic i mean my sister can do all kinds of handicrafts including patching people up and getting them to hospitals and getting them well again so it's it to me that's magic that's the best kind so you wrote and published uh alana the first adventure and the rest of that series and then what happened after that? Was the first book a big enough success you were able to say, ah, this is my day job now? <laughs> no, it didn't take off. There wasn't a big explosion or anything. What I did not know was that at that time, my editor, Jean Carl, was a legend in the industry. Her name alone on a book would sell it to booksellers and librarians. So they kept me in print, and I finished the quartet, and she wanted more from me. And I fumbled with a couple projects that I couldn't float. I wanted to do a historical novel set in Japan, feudal Japan, with the time-traveling girl. But I, that one got turned down six times by three different editors. And it was the late 80s, and I started to think, you know, I wonder what's going on in Tortal. And I thought, I wonder, Alana was for who I was at 12. 
I want to write more for somebody more like I am now, a semi-recluse who deals better with animals than people. And I want to show what's happened in, say, 10 years. And so I wrote up this idea for this girl named Dane. I saw this girl on the cover of a card tangling with animals who were climbing all over. And I thought, she looks like Trini Alvarado who played Mag at Little Women. And I thought, that's my game. And I started building out from there. And I pitched it to Jean and she took it. Kel was when I began to feel this sort of rumbling in the force. But this was when things really took off. And I remember, you know, because I, I really got into reading in the 90s because I was born in the 80s and the 90s was when I really started getting into fantasy and I was reading David Eddings and Raymond Feist and I remember seeing your books and I read, I haven't read that many, but I remember reading uh, Alana, The First Adventure and then later in, I think it was around 2003, was Trickster's Choice. Um, and at the time, especially in the 90s, I could be mistaken on this, but I remember you being pretty much one of the only people who was writing young adult fiction, fantasy, that featured women as the main characters. I wrote what I wanted to read when I was a teenager. In those days, in the 60s, there just weren't that many girl heroes. Usually, I found mine in historical fiction. I'd forgotten Edgar Rice Burroughs. Well, they weren't the heroes of the books. They were secondary characters, but his women were pretty strong. I read those when I was in grade school. My dad lent them to me. But for the books for kids my own age, they just weren't there. But, yeah, it was Robin and me. Robin McKinley. Yeah, Barbara Hambly in adult fiction. The three of us in the early 80s. Elizabeth Moon a couple years after. And Guy Gavriel Kay. He had pretty strong women, too, but... They mostly stuck to women's roles. So, yeah, it was pretty much me because Robin went on to doing fairy tale retellings, which are brilliant. I mean, Robin McKinley is a brilliant writer, but I was still doing the kick butt girls. But then I think your work really laid the groundwork in a lot of ways for some of the young adult fiction we've seen now with, you know, Hunger Games and Twilight and a lot of these ones have gotten really popular now, I don't think would have happened without the readers and writers who, you know, were influenced by your work. Well, that's what some of them have been telling me. <laughs> but it's true. I mean, I mean, without, as you were just saying, you know, if you don't have books that you can read where you can see yourself in the characters, it's very hard to imagine going off and, and re, you know, writing those sorts of books sometimes. Um, and I think your books help prepare the whole group of readership that then went on to Harry Potter and Hunger Games and all of these others. Well, and on that note, what advice would you give to a young person who is looking at writing and the career of writing and wants to start, you know, start on that themselves? Start writing. Keep writing. In our household, we have a saying, be too stupid to know when to quit. Oh, I like yeah, that. Yeah, we go also by Weird Al Yankovic's great wisdom, dare to be stupid. Because there are plenty of people in the world who are going to tell you, you can't make a living at it, you're not any good, you're wasting your time. There are lots of people who will do that for you. You don't need to do it for yourself. Mm -hmm. So just know that this is what you want. And if you keep at it, you'll get better. The more you do, the better you get. And then eventually you will start finishing things. Your characters will start feeling like real people. Your settings will start feeling like real settings. You won't feel like you're copying your favorite writer. And soon you will have things that somehow you will convince yourself are good enough to send out. And you will do more, and you'll send out more, and the more you send out, the better your chances are of selling something, and you build up a career that way. Don't expect to become instantly rich and famous. Some cases are different, but for a lot of people who expect to publish on the internet, self-publish, it doesn't work out. And for eight out of 10 of us, don't make a living at this. Eight out of 10 of us have to fit this in. And this is what I did all the way up to the 90s. We fit it in around our day jobs. 
We work at night. We work on our lunch hours. When I was writing books and for the radio company, I wrote Standing on Street Corners. None of us does this because it's a smart thing. We don't. We just don't. We do it because we have to, whether we're musicians, sculptors, painters, actors, writers. We do it because we have to. Do you ever find that there's some, and I love to ask different authors this, do you ever find that there is some element, whether that's an idea or a feeling or a character or a theme, something that you return to again and again over the course of your work? Always there's the idea that if you want it bad enough and you're willing to work hard enough, you can achieve anything you set out to do, but you really have to want it and you really have to work hard to do it because very few things in this world that you want that badly are achievable without a lot of work. This is especially true for the arts. You really, really have to want it and you have to give up a lot. Not everything, but a lot. Uh, you know, and I would also add to that that in some ways and not to discourage people, but in some ways, it does not get easier. No. You know, just because you, just because you write a story that is successful and and does what you were hoping it does, does not mean that your next story is going to do what you hope it's going to do. No. Uh, no. I mean, it it may, it may, it very well may, but it, may. it is always a process of discovery and and learning with each book. At least that's been my experience. Yes. No, that's been mine too. I sold three stories. And then I didn't sell another short story for two decades. I sold a couple articles and didn't sell another article for 10 years. So, like I said, we don't do this because we're smart. We do this because we're determined. So what are, you, what are you working on now? What can your fans look forward to from you next? I'm working on two things. One is a group project with my husband, Tim Levy, my assistant, Julie Holderman, Megan Messenger, who is an old fan friend from when she was 14, and a bunch of other friends. It's called A Spy's Guide to Tortal, and it's composed of a number of documents that detail the information they have about new arrivals in the kingdom and whether they should be suspect persons or not. Old friends like Sarge, new mayor himself, um, Dane. And that's coming out when? Next fall. Then there is, we still don't have a name for them. Um, so far, we're going with Exile Trilogy to talk about them. But it is the story of Numair, who is the male hero of the Immortals Trilogy, Dane's person, her teacher first, and then her lover, and now her husband. We're still trying to settle on titles. And that, that had better be 18, is what I'm saying right here, right now, because I've been slow. I keep having these medical things, and the date keeps getting moved back, and and now by cracky, it's gonna be sometime in 18, spring or fall, that's it. Yeah, t titles are hard to find sometimes. My, my experience is either you, get, either you get the title immediately, right at the beginning, or you end up struggling with it all the way until you finish the first, second, third draft, and you're still trying to figure out what the title is. I stink at titles. My worst titles for my books, those are mine. The Woman <laughs> Who Rides Like a Man, that one's mine. I kind of like that title. It, uh, it, uh, I Sometimes my foreign publishers come up with better titles than I do. I wish I had had the British titles for the first circle of Magic Quartet. The Magic and the Weaving, The Power and the star, Storm, The Fire and the Forging, and The Healing in the Vine. Gosh, I wish I'd had those. Sandry's book, Triss's book, Dodge's book, and Breyer's book just don't ring the same. Most of my foreign publishers kept the same titles, except my German publishers said, ah, we're going to call every book Aragon and just give it a subtitle. And you know what? It worked. It worked. Oh, yes. Yes, I'm going to be at Worldcon. I am a guest of honor at Worldcon this year. 
Oh, congratulations. I have never actually been to Worldcon. It depends on how you are on lots and lots and lots and lots of people. I have been to this will be my third. There are lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of people at Worldcons. Well, the thing I like about the sci-fi fantasy conventions is that everyone gathered there is enthusiastic about something. You know, maybe, oh, yeah. the, maybe it's an anime, maybe it's a comic book, maybe it's Tolkien, maybe it's something else entirely, maybe it's the Hannibal TV show, but everyone is a fan of something, and that sort of concentrated enthusiasm is uh, a wonderful thing to be around, I think, and it's, it's so full of optimism as well that everyone is there because they love something. Yes, yes, and they, especially the ones that love books. I mean, where are you going to find, well, a, a, the American Library Association or Book Expo, but that many people who love books, it's and the books you love, that's that's great. Well, I hopefully lots of people will go to see you at Worldcon. And thank you very much for uh, agreeing to speak with me today and doing this interview. It was a lot of fun. I hope you enjoyed it as well. Thank you, I did, and it was wonderful to see you again. Same here. And I do highly encourage everyone who watched to go uh, seek out Tamara's books. Um, they're all good, especially uh, if you have some younger readers in the family uh, and older readers as well. Thank you, Christopher. <laughs>